So please turn your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke. If you're new to the Bible, the Gospel of Luke is one of the four biographies written about Jesus. You can find it in the front of your Bible by looking up the table of contents. It's in the New Testament, so the Old Testament the books written before Jesus, New Testament is the book written after Jesus. And it's just three books in, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We're going to be in chapter 8, which you can find by looking for the big number. We're going to be reading verses 1 down through verse 21. And again, as you turn there, uh, just so you know, we're a church that encourages questions, that encourages exploring, um, encourages even expressing doubts and lack of understanding about things. And so if you have any questions that come up during the sermon, there'll be a number on the screen. You see it at the top there. Please feel free to text them in. Um, I'd love to try to answer them on, on, on our church blog later on. Um, happy to even get together with you one-on-one -on -one and have a back and forth if you want. Um, please uh, don't just have a question, but share your questions so that we can find truth through God. We've been going through this, this series in the Gospel of Luke that we're calling Jesus Unfiltered. And we're calling it that because Luke wrote this uh, just a few years after Jesus left the earth. And he wrote it based upon eyewitnesses and accounts of people who actually spent time with Jesus. And so as we go through Luke, really what we're seeing, we're seeing Jesus as he truly is. Jesus stripped away from all that you know, organized religion and tradition has added over the decades. This is Jesus unfiltered. And today we're going to be reading verses 1 all the way down through verse 21. And it's a long portion of scripture. So to help you keep track of where we're going and to see how these different things connect together, I want you to pay attention to this word. We're going to see it ten times in these 21 verses. And the word is here. The word is here. Whenever you see a word being repeated in the Bible again and again and again, it's God saying, hey, pay attention to this. These things are meant to be seen together. They're meant to drive a point home. And so ten times in these 21 verses, we're going to see that word here, and that's what these word is. This section of scripture is really driving at. It's driving at hearing from God. And so, verses one through three, we're going to see how even unlikely people can hear from God. In verses four through fifteen, we're going to see well, the problem though is that we can also hear other things at times. In verses sixteen through eighteen, we're going to see how to cut through that noise, and then finally, in verses nineteen through twenty-one, we're going to see why hearing matters, like hearing matters. And so let's turn our attention to God's word. I'm going to read this section in its entirety and then pray. God's word says, soon after he, meaning Jesus, went on through cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him. And also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene, to whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's household manager, and Susanna, and many others, who provide for them out of their means. And when a great crowd was gathering, and people from town after town came to him, he said in a parable, A sower went out to sow a seed. And as he sowed, some fell along the path and was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air devoured it. And some fell on the rock, and as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it. And some fell into good soil, and it grew and yielded a hundredfold. And as he said these things, he called out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when his disciples asked him what the parable meant, he said to you, has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God. But for others they are in parables, so that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. Now, now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. The one along the path of those who have heard, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts, so that they may not believe and be saved. And the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear the word, receive it with joy. But these have no root. They believe for a while, and in time of testing, fall away. And as for what fell among the thorns, they are those who hear. But as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. 
As for that in the good soil, there are those who, hearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart, and bear fruit with patience. No one, after laying a lamp, covers it with a jar or puts it under a bed, but puts it on stand so that those who enter it may see the light. For nothing is hidden that will not be made manifest, nor is anything secret that will not be known and come to light. Take care, then, how you hear. For to the one who has, more will be given, and to the one who has not, even when he thinks that he has, will be taken away. Then his mothers and brothers came to him, but they could not reach him because of the crowd. And he was told, Your mother and your brothers are standing outside desiring to see you. But he answered them, My mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. Let's bow our heads together in prayer. Lord, I pray this morning that you would help us to hear your word. That you would open up these verses to us. They were written by your servant Luke, based upon people who were there and heard you preach this lie. Lord, you preserved this throughout the millennia for us today because there is something you want us to learn. You, you want us to learn something out of what it means to hear from you. And so I pray that you would help us to do that. And Lord, I pray also just for our children that are gathered in children's ministry. I pray that they, they would hear from you. I pray that you would use the teachers that are there, Lord God, to speak and to teach them in a way they can understand so that we would continue to be a church that has generation after generation that hears from you, responds to you, and therefore glorifies you. Praise in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so our first section this morning, just looking at verses 1 through 3, is, is really this point about how even unlikely people can hear from God. This section opens by Jesus saying that he is proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom. And as we've already seen in this book, this is the common message of Jesus. Or Jesus taught that we we're born in this world, living in the kingdom ruled by self. We naturally live for ourselves instead of using the life that God gave us to live for Him. Living for self is known as the kingdom of self, and it's what the Bible calls sin. Sin is not necessarily doing bad things. It's just having a heart that's turned inward. inward. It's believing that life is determined by me. That's the kingdom of self. We're on the throne and calling the shots. <laughs> But Jesus' message is that he came to bring the kingdom of God, to take us out of the kingdom of self and bring us into his kingdom, where we now serve him as king. And he says this is how our souls actually find true liberation. Because the reality is we weren't made to live with ourselves in the center of our lives. We weren't made to sit on the throne of our hearts. We were made by God to glorify God, to seek to honor him from how we follow his ways. And so the kingdom of self is actually a kingdom of slavery. Because when we're at the center, we weren't created to be there, and so we'll never be fulfilled by being there. And so we go from thing to thing because we always feel this emptiness inside of us looking to fulfill us through different acts. And it's slavery. It's a constant sense of being driven. But the kingdom of God is where we experience what we were created for. It's where we experience freedom. It's where we experience the liberation as God becomes the center of our lives. This has been Jesus' message. It's been the good news of the kingdom of God, that he has come to bring God's rule to any who have faith in him. Right? That, that's why it's called the good news of the kingdom. The kingdom is for every, anyone, even those who are unlikely. The unlikely nature of those who come to know this good news is pointed out in these three verses. We are told that as Jesus is preaching this good news, he has the twelve with him. Let's remember who the twelve are. These are the twelve men that Jesus chose to be his apostles, the, the people who would be the foundation for his church. Here's who Jesus picked. Two brothers who were so out of control with their anger that they were called the sons of thunder. You had one person who was a tax collector, which was a profession 
where you extorted people for money. The scummiest of the scum. State-sanctioned crooks. The rest were mostly fishermen, which was not exactly a prestigious job, not usually the place you go looking for talent. This is a ragtag group of guys. But through choosing them, Jesus is communicating something. He is communicating that he didn't come to the people who have it all together. No, Jesus came to, through his power, use messed up people who were radically changed by God to then be deployed into the service of God. Right? That's what Jesus is doing. These disciples were, were messed up people who were radically changed by God to then be deployed into service for God. He didn't come to the book together. Jesus came to put people together. And as he is proclaiming and bringing the good news of his kingdom with him all the time is living proof of those who can testify to the goodness of his good news. These men had, had heard Jesus' message and they responded. Because even the unlikely can hear from God. But this thing continues as we look at the other names who are listed. Verse 2 says that also some women were with him. And we just need to pause there because that's unusual in and of itself. In ancient times, it would be somewhat common for, for men to latch onto a teacher and follow him and learn from him. But that was something that women were actually not allowed to do. It's a very oppressive culture towards women. And so the fact that Luke is even mentioning one here is shocking. This would have raised eyebrows for his original audience. What? Jesus is speaking to women? This is not something that was done in ancient times. But Jesus isn't bound by the times. Jesus is the eternal God, and he knows that he created men and women equally in their value, worth, meaning, and purpose. And so Jesus didn't just have men as his disciples, he had women he brought. And not just any women, but here's who these women are. Some women who have been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, and he names one specifically, Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out. Now, in a few weeks we're going to drill down a little more specifically about what it means to have a demon in you. Uh, but for now, just know this. This is not a good situation. Right? She would have been known as one of the worst of sinners. Her, her specific sin isn't mentioned. Historically, people have thought maybe she's a prostitute. The Bible doesn't actually say that. But it does say that she was definitely known as a sinner because she had these demons in her. And yet she had been delivered and saved by Jesus. So you have a woman who is demon-possessed. Then you have kind of the exact opposite end of the spectrum. You have Joanna, who's the wife of Chusa, Herod's, Herod's household manager. All right, Herod was the king of Israel. What Rome would do is when they go in, they would conquer people, but then they knew the best way to kind of keep those people at peace and pay their taxes, it always gets back to the money, uh, the best way to get the most money out of the people was to put a king over them that was from them. Right? And that's who Herod was. He was a Jewish man who was king of Israel. And so he was one of the most powerful people in Israel. And his household manager would have been in charge of all of his affairs. And so Jews is a very high-ranking individual. You know, think of like a, a chief of staff. That's, that's the stature this person happened. And so his wife would have had power, would have had prestige. Total contrast from Mary Magdalene. And, and then you have Susanna, Who's a total nobody? This, this is the only place in Scripture she's mentioned, and nothing else is given to us except her name. And so think about what's being represented in these specific women who are being mentioned. You have a demon possessed woman, a prestigious woman, and an obscure woman. And all have heard and responded to Jesus' message of the kingdom of God. And so, friends, we are being taught something through these names. We're being taught that anyone can get into this kingdom. The kingdom of God is not based on race. It's not based on socioeconomic background. It's not based on being a good religious person. It's not based on gender. No, anyone can get in, no matter how unlikely, if they hear and respond to this message of 
Jesus. You know, in our culture, we're constantly creating different strata of people, different categories that we can put people in. So in order to be welcome in a certain context, you need to act this way, or come from this background, or have this type of skin color. Jesus blows past all that. You know, he has men and women, both are welcome, powerful and obscure, both are welcome, prestigious and sinful, both are welcome, all are welcome into his kingdom, anyone who hears him can come to him, these people are all unlikely, but it's the likely people that Jesus came for. And so here's a question that the text asks us at this point. Who's unlikely in your life? But who's the person that you think will never respond to God? I think one of the biggest things that gets in the way of the message of Jesus getting out is our lack of faith that people will respond to it. We think people are unlikely, and so we don't even bother to share. I can do that. I have done that. You think this person, man, they have it all together. What need would they have for Jesus? I don't even know how I'll begin to address that. Or, 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 you, or you think, man, this person's just too far gone. They come from such a different background. There's no way they could ever turn from all they've known their whole life. Friends, we need to hear this text speaking to us. No one is too high, and no one is too low, and no one is, comes from a certain background, and no one is beyond the reach of God. We need to stop putting limits where God says there are none. Maybe you're here today, and you would say, well, I'm only a likely person I know is me. I feel unlikely. Maybe you're here today, and you feel like you're just too sinful. You, you've done too much. God can never welcome you. I hope you hear God saying something to you through this text this morning. He has you here precisely because he wants to welcome you. Maybe you're like, man, I have come from this background. This is all new to me. I've just got so many questions about all this. Listen, this would be really encouraging. This was all new to all these people, right? None of them came from this background. I think so many times you just put people in this box, oh, they're from a different religion or they have different history. Listen, these people all had a different religion, they all had a different history, and here they are following Jesus, right? No one had a background in the, in the, in the New Testament. Jesus is doing something radically new. And so, friends, no matter how unlikely you feel, we need to remember that God's kingdom is made up of all kinds of unlikely people. And so we need to stop putting limits on what God can do and start believing that anyone can hear from him no matter how unlikely. But the problem is, which really takes us to section number two, is that we also can hear other things at times. After listening to these people who are with him, Jesus goes on in verse four to start telling a parable. A parable is simply a story with a point. He, he tells this parable of the sower, right? We just read it. Who goes out and puts seed into the ground. And all these seeds have different responses. Different things happen. And after saying this story, he says in verse 8, he ends it, verse 8, by saying, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Same way of saying, if you want to understand, you will understand. And that's what his disciples do. They want to understand. And so they ask Jesus in verse 9 what he meant. And I love that. I love that having ears to hear doesn't mean you have all the answers. It means that you have a desire to search for the answers. These disciples had ears to hear. They, they wanted to understand more, and so they went to Jesus for understanding, and he explained the parable to them. In verse 11, he says, Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. Word means revelation. It's what the Greeks called it. This was originally written in Greek, called the Logos. It's the revelation of truth. And we know that Jesus has already taught that he is the truth. The word of God is not an it. The word of God is a someone. Jesus is the word of God. Jesus is the truth. And so the sower is the one who shares about Jesus, who, who sends his word out. 
And, and as we see this, here's what we have to get right out of the state. If you look at the different responses, the different kinds of soils and what happens. We need to notice there's different responses to the word, but everyone in this parable heard the word. Did, did you see that being repeated again and again? This person heard the word, this person heard the word, and this person heard the word. Listen, they all had the same experience. They all heard the word. Their problem was not that they didn't hear, was not that they didn't get given the information. No, their problem was they also heard something else. It wasn't that they didn't hear the word of God, it was that they chose to listen to other voices. Here's the first voice given in verse 12. The one along the path are those who have heard, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts, so that they may not believe and be saved. Now, at first glance, I'll be honest, this seems a little unfair. But great, yeah, the devil took the seed away before they even had an opportunity to respond. That doesn't seem very fair to them. But we have to notice why the devil is able to take the seed away. It says the seed fell on the path. We don't live in ancient Israel, so this might not be readily apparent to us. But a path is a terrible place to sow seed, right? No farmer goes out and tries to put seed into a path. Because what makes a path a path is that it is hard in the ground. Right? If you see a path through grass or, or through the sand, it's the place where people walk over and over again, and the crowd ground has become stamped down and hardened. Hardness is what makes a path. And so what Jesus is saying here is that the reason the seed doesn't get into the people's hearts, but is left out to the devil to pluck away, is because their hearts are already hardened. Here's what we have to understand, friends. The devil never creates opportunity. He just takes advantage of opportunity. The opportunity for the devil to come and take the seed away was given because the people's hearts were already hardened like a path. And if you're familiar with the Bible, that word hardened is maybe beginning to, to ring a couple notes for you. One of the most famous stories that talks about the hardness of heart is the story of Moses and Pharaoh. Right? When Moses comes to the king uh, of, of Egypt, the Pharaoh, and says, hey, let my people go. Well, it's repeated again and again. Despite all the signs and miracles that that person sees, again and again, says Pharaoh hardened his heart. He didn't want to listen. And that's what Jesus is saying. That some people are like. They don't want to hear. Not because they aren't given the message, but because they don't have any desire to listen to the message. Because they don't want to give up self rule. Because they have no desire to be soft towards God, hard hard towards God so that they continue to be justified in the inward return towards self. That's the first group. It's, it's the hard-hearted, the people who only listen to self. Here's the second group. It's given in verse 13. And the ones of the rock are those who, when they hear the word, receive with joy, but these have no root. They believe for a while, in time of testing they fall away. And so you see what happens is people receive God's word, take it in, but then the times of testing come. And when we hear that word testing, maybe you're having flashbacks to scary moments of high school, different tests that you had. That's not all what this word means in this context. Uh, this word testing comes from the ancient practice of making metal. Metal would be put in a fire, and all that was weak in that metal, all that was impure, would be burned off of it. Impure metal burns off at lower temperatures than, than the pure steel. And so what you would do is you would take metal and you would test it. You would take steel and you would put it in. And all that would be impure, all that would be weak in it would burn away. So that what would come out would be stronger and would be better. Burning through a fire was how things were tested. Listen, friends, life can send us fire sometimes, too. Think of the pain of personal tragedy. In those, in those times of being under fire, there can be a crisis of faith. We can ask questions like, if there's a God, why would you allow something like this? That's a very hard question. I have personally asked that question at various times in my life. I think some of life's most painful questions are why God allows so much to me. And there are answers to that. Answers that I preached on many times before. 
But they are hard questions. They're like flames that test us. Will we be weak and fall into the fire, or will we actually come out stronger? Because here's the truth, friends. Pain can either make you lean into God or run away from God. It can either make you better or it can make you bitter. And sadly, there are those who, when these times of testing come, they run. And that's just a real tragedy, because guess what? When you allow your pain to turn you away from God, you still have your pain, and now you also have no place for comfort. Said very often, I'd rather be in pain with God than in pain without God. But that's sadly not everyone's experience. There's some of these times of testing come, and they, they do, they fall away. And that takes us to the, the third group in verse 14. As for what fell among the thorns, there are those who hear, but as they go on the way, they're choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit is not mature. Like, see, these are people who, who hear God's word and respond to it. But they also want to keep all these side hustles in their life. You know, Jesus says that they, they have the cares of the world. He's just talking about things that are the focus of our attention, what we center our lives around that are not him. There's the world and there's Jesus. And the center of our lives is always meant to be reserved for God. Well, if we put something else at the center and still try to keep him as a part of our life, but not the center of our life, eventually what is at the center will choke out our love for God. It'll be like a thorn that gets nourished. And Okay, so you have the, the plant growing up, but you also have this other thing growing up, and as it does, it chokes out the plant. To illustrate this, Jesus uses the example of money. Right? He talks about riches. Few things reveal our hearts more than how we use our finances. Right? So, okay, I want to worship God, absolutely, and I'm happy to do that as we sing on Sunday, but as soon as that offering passes, we're like, not much in that way. I work hard for it. You know, we, we hoard and we hold on. We look to finances for our safety. We look to finances for our security. We look to finances for our satisfaction. But money is a poor substitute for God, friends. And as Jesus says elsewhere, you cannot serve both God and money. You can't. There's nothing wrong with having money. But well, what do we do with it? What we do with it reveals and shows our hearts. Is God at the center of our hearts and is God informed how we use our finances or our finances at the center of our hearts and God just fits in as we can get into the budget every now and then? What is it? What is it? And then he says, you know, also pleasure. Pleasure can do this. This is just going from thing to thing that makes us feel good in the moment. Now listen, there's nothing wrong with pleasure. God actually created pleasure. But God knows that he's the only one who can actually lead us to lasting pleasure and joy. Right? You might feel pleasure in a night, but it always comes to hang over in the morning. And so again, you have, you have all these different kinds of people. They've all heard from God, but the message never gets rooted down in their hearts because they have these other things that they're listening to. The hard-hearted, who are listening not to anyone outside themselves. The, the rocky hearted who are letting pain speak louder to them than the comfort of God. Thorny hearts who are letting things in this world be in places that they shouldn't. Right? You have self, pain, and things in the world. These are all things that shout for our attention. These are all voices that compete <laughs> for our ears. But God wants us to experience this in verse 15. As for those in the good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bear fruit with patience. Friends, God wants us to be able to hold fast against the hard-hearted voice of self, against the voice of our pain, against the pursuit of this world. He wants us to hold fast in Him with honest hearts, not having anything else crowding in there. No, just open and honest before Him. And this is how we bear fruit in our life. In the Bible, fruit is symbolic for abundance, for, for thriving, for living as God intended us to live. And so when all these voices are coming at us, when all these different things are, are calling for our ears, how do we cut through this noise and actually hear from God? How do we have these hearts that take in this word and receive it and live abundantly? 
Let's take to section number three, how to, how to cut through the noise. This is what Jesus gets into in verse 16. He says, no one after lighting a lamp covers it with a jar or puts it under a bed, but puts it on a stand so those who enter it may see the light. I broke this little song, this little light of mine. I don't know let it shine, right? And there are other parts of the Bible that talk about how we need to let our shine, light shine to others. But this is why we need to be careful, friends, and don't take a little song you heard or another part of Scripture that you need to understand this Scripture. Because this Scripture is not at all talking about our light. That's not, that's not the light that needs to shine here. Because, verse 17 goes on to say, For nothing is hidden that will not be made manifest, nor is anything secret that will not be known and come to light. The light that's being talked about here is the light of revelation. The light that looks on things that are hidden and makes them manifest, makes them known. Friends, that's not something that we do. Luke has already told us what this light is. There's a great way to read the Bible. Like, I'm not sure what he means by light. Look at how the word is used in that book already by the author. So, so Luke has already written a lot about light. He recounts how it's prophesied in Luke chapter 1, verse 79, that Jesus would give light to those who sit in darkness. And then again in Luke 2, 32, it says, Jesus will be a light of revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. Friends, you said Jesus is the light. Jesus is the one who brings revelation. He's the one who cuts through the noise, all the other voices that, that are trying to get us to hear them. When our hearts are hardened and we're just being so consumed with self, that is dangerous ground for Satan to come in and snatch away whatever the truth is before us. And so what we need to have for our hard hearts is for to be softened by Jesus, who did not come for self, but who came to show what it looks like to be a selfless servant and to give your life for others. But when our pain is speaking louder to us and causing us to question the very goodness of God, what we need is to go to Jesus and see afresh the pain he bore on our behalf. It is very hard to ask the question of God, why would you allow this? But it's also very hard to stare honestly at the cross of Jesus Christ and say, God, why would you allow that? As the only innocent person who ever lived is put on public display and executed for sins that are not his own. Something when I go through the pain of my Crohn's disease that flares up at different times, some of the sweetest moments I have are moments of pain where I'm like, this is nothing compared to the pain I should know because of my sins, but will never know because Jesus bore it for me. Pain can turn from God or can be a reminder that your God is a God who knows very deeply what it means to be there. When we're tempted to love other things and to build our lives with something other than God at the center, what we need is to go to Jesus and to let him cut through that noise and remind him that he remind us that he, he came to give us eternal life. Listen, everything in this world is temporary. Anything that we give ourselves to other than God won't last. He is the only eternal one and therefore the only one who can satisfy the longing of our eternal souls. And so friends, how we cut through the noise of what self and pain and the pleasures of this world would say to us, how we cut through that noise is by staying close to Jesus, by allowing his light to continue to shine into our hearts. How often we can take his light and put it under a basket. We allow other things to pile up, to be placed over him. And that diminishes the light that we're meant to live our lives with. Makes me think of my first desk that I had right out of college. I was given a job and the desk was all clean, right? And I was in sales, I got my first contract, and I put it on my desk. And I'll follow it later. And a few days later, I couldn't even find it anymore because of all the things that piled up on my desk. And you just place things over. How often 
We do that. We place things over Jesus, and the next thing you know, man, it sure were easy now. We start putting baskets on top of his love. Or, or, or we shove him under the bed because he's getting in the way. And so I'm not really going to focus on Jesus right now because I don't really need to focus on my career. I focus on making money. Or I don't really care what Jesus says about this relationship. I, I want it. And so this relationship is going to be more important to me than my Savior. And the next thing you know, the light of Jesus is hidden under so many baskets that we put on over him that we, we don't even see him anymore. And Jesus warns what the effect of that is in verse 18. He says, Take care then how you hear, for to the one who has, more will be given. And to the one who has not, even when he thinks that he has, will be taken away. Do you see what Jesus is saying? He's saying, Hey, if you're hearing from me, keep leaning in. Right? If, if you have what I'm saying, the more that you press in, the more you'll understand. You'll just continue to grow and to thrive. But if you don't, even though you might think you have revelation, that you know some things, oh, the knowledge that you have will be taken away. I had a friend a couple years ago who was like, yeah, you know, I'm not really sure about Jesus anymore because I have questions about his faith. He said, okay, well, how are you engaging in those questions? Well, you know, I'm not really reading my Bible anymore. I'm not really looking into this stuff anymore. I'm not really. It's like, what you have is going to be taken away. No problem with questions, but what are you doing with those questions? Do you actually have ears to hear, or are you just, yeah, I don't, I don't want this anymore? Big difference between having questions that you generally want answers to, and having desires, and how you think God should be, and when he doesn't fit in your box, you just move on and look for a different box. Friends, how we cut through the noise is by keeping Jesus as our light. Living our lives as followers of him. Listening to what he says and allowing him to be the revelation, the truth that we base our whole selves on. And here's why it matters. This is the last section. Jesus lays out why it matters in verses 19 through 21. This interesting episode. His, his family's trying to get him to see him. But Jesus does something really shocking. Instead of letting them in to see them, he actually uses this as a teaching moment. And listen, it's, it's not because Jesus doesn't care about his biological family. Now, we know he had great affection for his family, particularly his mother. We'll see that even at the cross. But Jesus uses this as a teaching moment, as he says in verse 21, My mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and hear it. See, Jesus is teaching us that Biological family is one thing, but spiritual family is something totally different. And Jesus is identifying his true family, not as those who are biologically connected to him, but those who are spiritually connected to him. That, that, that's a real family. And how do you know if you're really part of that family? How do you know if you're really connected to God in that way? It's not just by people who hear, who are around in the crowd, but it's by people who are doing and putting what he says into action. Right? Jesus is teaching that someone who is truly part of his family will want to bear the family resemblance. Will want to live in accordance with the Heavenly Father's ways. That's who's in the family. And that's why how we hear really matters. Listen, we can sit in church services. We can go to Bible studies. We can watch preaching and teaching online. The, the Opportunities to hear really are endless. But are we actually hearing according to how God wants it? Are we just gaining knowledge? Or are we learning how to apply it to our lives? Do we care about applying it to our lives? Are we letting what we're learning about God shape who we are? I ask this question often. But it's the question of when was the last time something in your life changed because of something you heard from God's word. Friends, that should be our ongoing experience as Christians. Right? I'll, the person here who has it all figured out, I certainly don't. And so the question I constantly ask is, how is my life changing based on what I'm hearing here? Something we should be asking weekly, in fact, daily. Because we're people who constantly need change. Are we growing in the family resentment? Or are 
we're just spending time around the Lord. You get that difference? It, it, someone can come over to my house for dinner and they can see how my family functions. That's different than being actually part of my family. And I wonder how many of us are comfortable coming to the dinner and just seeing the family and being like, oh, okay, that's how we do things, that's how they do that. Well, that's interesting. And, and thinking that maybe we're, we're kind of associated with the family, but we're actually not. Listen, if, if you're here and you're not a Christian, this is a safe place to explore and ask your questions. You don't have to be pressured into anything. We don't do, you know, highly emotional altar calls where you're going to be pressured into some kind of decision. We don't believe in that, okay? It's a safe place to explore your questions. But, but what I never want to do, and I want to be sure I'm, I'm careful with, is this. I, I want to be very clear who's part of the family and who's not. That's not to make you feel bad, but hopefully it's meant to make you feel invited in. If we just come and we just hear things week after week, or see things, or even go to small groups, Bible studies, where we are actually letting our lives be shaped by God's word, friends, we're not in the family, we're just spending time around the family. Now this is a journey, again, this is not something that we grow in this over time, it's not like we just get it, but this is the question. Are we hearing from God in this way? Like, this is why it matters, friends. That's why hearing from God matters. If we're not hearing from God, then as Jesus is saying here, we're not part of his family. And that's the invitation. He wants us part of his family. Like, he wants us to have that bond. Think about what's being offered to us. The opportunity to call family of God in a deeper way than he even called his own mother. That's what Jesus is offering us to. You know? You think Mary's close to me? She's not even... Near as close as someone who hears the word of God and does it. That's who my family is. That's why I want you to be here. This is an invitation, friends. This is why this matters. God does not want us to be looking on at the family dinner. He wants us sitting down at the table and being part of the family. And his family is open to anyone. No matter how unlikely. Right? Point number one. Even unlikely people can hear from God. His family will always have other voices trying to draw us away from him. Point number two. But Jesus is our light that cuts through all that noise and keeps us centered. Point number three. And so friends, point number four, let's make sure we're hearing from him. Let's study his word, apply his word, and commit to doing his word together as a church family. let's, Let's hear from God. And as we do, Oh, let's get excited about the amazing things that he wants to do here in South Philadelphia for his glory. Let's pray.